Book Two, The Gold of Ahmad Shah. Soviet military units appear to have failed to develop strong primary group attachments among the soldiers and between leadership elements and their men. This represents a potential for instability and fragmentation under combat stress. Therefore, the effectiveness of Soviet military units in prolonged battle, when quick victories are not forthcoming, is open to question. Soviet military units could well begin to unravel if pressed hard enough in a conventional battle environment. From this perspective, Soviet units contain a great systemic weakness. Professor R. A. Gabriel, the New Red Legions. One, Ura Pobeda, Hail Victory. Kalantut Village, northwest of Kabul. Afghanistan, April twenty third. In Afghanistan, someone who was six foot tall, with grey green eyes and dark hair, if he spoke a local language perfectly, was almost certainly an Afghan. Adam Durrani fitted that bill, having been born in the American-built town of Lashkargah. A hundred miles from the Pakistan border, where his father had been an engineer working on the Great Kajakai Dam. Following his father's bent, Adam had studied engineering in America, but drawn to the land of his birth and its passion for modernization, he had returned to Afghanistan. Armed with a doctorate and understanding the people so completely, he soon acquired the chair of technology at the University of Kabul. But the great transformation of the country dreamed of since the war had not come. Communist infiltration, intrigue, and ultimately the Soviet invasion from the north to restore order and support the socialist government had seen to that. That was why Adam Durrani was a rebel, a wanted man, an Afghan guerrilla operating from the stark fastnesses of the Pagman range of mountains to the north of Kabul. Dressed in the roughest of clothes, shirt, and baggy trousers, he carried a Kalashnikov slung across his back. When, on that December day, the huge Russian Antonov transports had landed at Kabul, and the tanks had rolled south along the great circle of all-weather roads the Russians had built for that very purpose, Adam stayed at his post, but not for long. Peasants tried to attack the tanks with sticks and stones. Soldiers with only five rounds of ammunition tried to resist. Air force men crashed their planes onto the teeming invaders. Many others simply fled or resigned themselves to oppression. But a plan was forming in Adam's mind. One day there would be a resistance movement. That was inevitable in a fiercely independent mountain land with a powerful military tradition. At first, it would spring up locally, people rallying to their accepted chiefs. Thousands, however, would die, lacking the skills and the weapons needed to fight this new kind of war. There would have to be impregnable bases within Afghanistan and friends outside. There would have to be exploits too to fire the people's imagination, and there would have to be scientific and technical knowledge. When he reached this point in his reasoning, Adam remembered Pagman. His family were friends of the princely Sirdar Akbar of Pagman, and as a lad, Adam had spent his summer vacations in the cool sun of the Pagman uplands. He had fished and skied, gone horse riding, and rambled all over the sprawling mountain ranges, so near to Kabul and yet so cool. Bliss indeed after the summer heat of the desert of death. Near his native Kandahar, it was at the Pagman Castle that he had met little Noor Sharifi, the daughter of the house. He had taught her to ride, to shoot, and to catch trout. One summer, though Noor had suddenly seemed to be a child no longer, he remembered how he had thought that it was absurd to send a beautiful woman, his Noor, away to school. But that was the Sirdar's wish. A school in London, England, and so they had lost touch. 
One day, in that last summer before she left, Adam had been on a particularly long hike deep in the mountains when he noticed a long, rather regular shadow in the rocks just above him. The shadow turned out to be a slit which continued horizontally into the mass of the mountain. Scrambling along it, Adam found that the slit widened. He was in a man-made tunnel. After making two or three turns, Adam entered an enormous cavern, with caves running in all directions from it. Astonishingly, the mountain hall was lit by daylight. Fissures, protected from view by the high spurs, ran into the cave's roof, each in turn catching the sun in its passage across the sky. A dim but adequate light suffused this extraordinary natural cathedral. He understood at once that he had found one of the lost Buddhist cave monasteries, abandoned a thousand and more years ago when the monks had emigrated after the Islamic conquest. He told nobody. The secrecy which had protected the place for so long seemed to capture him, too. Adam was no occultist, but something said to him that the monastery was sleeping and that its time would come again. Twenty years later, the realization came. The cave monastery could be a virtually impregnable fortress from which a rebel army, thousands strong, could challenge the Red occupation. When the Russians moved into Afghanistan, the Pagman Heights were snowbound. Adam waited four months, making preparations. In April, he returned to the monastery to make quite sure. This time he found there was another way in, which could be used by trucks and horses, skillfully concealed and easy to defend. As he stood at one of the creeper-covered entrances to the smaller caves, Adam saw, high in the sky, a tiny flying figure. It swooped, then flew up again and hovered. Kara Kush, the eagle. His old nurse had called him that when he was small, and it had become a pet name in the family. My little eagle, Kara Kush, she used to say. She was a Turkestani, and Kara Kush was a Turkey word. Adam remembered how the Persian-speaking boys at school had laughed when, foolishly, he had confided his pet name. Kara Kush, the eagle, ha ha ha! A bully had come up to him, a boy three years older and very tough. Who's a stupid little Turkestani then? Karakush, Karakush, want to fight? The answer had come to him in a flash. In Turkey it may mean eagle, but in Dari Persian it can be said as instant kill. Get away or I'll knock you down. The other boys had cheered and then turned on the bully, who never troubled Adam again. Karakush. He'd take that name to beat the Red Bully. It symbolised the Afghan people. Back in Kabul, Adam had drawn his money gradually from the bank and sold everything of value. Food, scientific equipment, all kinds of tools and materials were bought and carried by him and his close friend Kasim to the caves. Then, subletting his apartment and giving out that he was going to attend a conference for a few weeks, he bought a return air ticket to nearby Pakistan. Adam stayed only three days in Pakistan before returning on horseback along the smuggler's route. It was also called the Rahi Gorez, the Road of Flight, and ran through the mountains south of Chitral. The people of Nuristan, a wild, untamed country, helped him reach Pagman and safety. Kasim was waiting. Victory, Kara Kush. Since then, Girdbad, the whirlwind battle group led by the Eagle, had grown from its original two men to a strength of some sixty-five would-be warriors. Each one had been double and triple checked and tested for reliability even before he was allowed to visit the caves. In rural Afghanistan, security was not difficult to operate. Everyone seemed to know everyone else. 
and the information channels to Kabul, even to the highest quarters, were excellent. Nobody liked the puppet government. Training and arms were the first priority. The ancient rifles, Lee Enfield .303s from British Indian days, were next to useless, almost as bad as muzzle loaders when faced by really modern weapons. Yet around the country, in dozens of places, were dumps of the latest guns, mines, rocket launchers which had been stockpiled by the Russians. Over 60 men and only five guns. And the men, tired of training with dummy weapons, needed both guns and a successful exploit, something to raise their spirits. The eagle cast an envious eye on the Russian supply centre near the village of Kalantut, some ten miles from his Pagman Eri. He planned to raid it now, reconnoitring with a patrol of five men. Kasim called it an attack group. Whatever it was called, it consisted only of Adam, Kasim, old Kizriat, who was seventy but an uncannily skilful tracker, Tirandas, a level-headed local peasant and crack shot, and young Aslam Jan, fifteen years old but from a warrior family. First, Adam decided they would go into Kalantut village itself to collect information and, if possible, operate from there when evening came. As they came near the first house, they realized that something was disastrously wrong. There was no sound of village life. The smell of death hung in the air. On the wall of a burnt-out stone barn, they saw the words, whitewashed in Cyrillic, the Soviet war cry, Ura Pobeda, Hail Victory. All the cottage roofs were down, and blackened windows showed where the firebombs had done their work. The little mosque had been blasted by high explosive shells, and the schoolhouse was still smouldering. Row upon row of machine gun bullets had patterned the flimsy walls of a vine covered tea house under the solitary tree, the only one left from a row of eight graceful poplars. More than fifty corpses, of old men, women and children, lay inside what was left of the houses. The bellies of the corpses were already swelling in the heat. Some of the faces looked strangely peaceful. Some people had died contorted, burnt with flamethrowers or riddled with bullets from automatic rifles. For good measure, the village well had been wrecked by high-explosive grenades and the minute grocery shop looted as was another pitifully small general store. There was one survivor of the massacre, an old man, bleary-eyed with advancing cataracts, who had been lying ill behind a stone-built cowshed when the attack began. He had crawled painfully to shelter, hardly knowing what he was doing, obeying, even in his last hours, the imperative to survive. He had reached a depression in the ground, a culvert which had once fed a pond, now long since dry and partly filled with rubbish. This had shielded him from the bullets. His name was Haji, Pilgrim, Abdurashid. He said he was seventy-eight years old, but he looked much older than that. When Kasim found him, he had just dragged himself from his hiding place in search of water. It was obvious that he did not have long to live, and the eagle wanted desperately to know any fact about the massacre, anything that might help to understand how it could have come about. He got no explanation. The haji lived for only an hour more. All he could say was that the men of the village, whose ages ranged from fourteen to sixty-five, had fled six days ago to escape conscription and had thought that their families would be safe enough. None of them had been guerrillas. Then, that morning, only a few hours before, Russian soldiers from the camp four kilometres away, heavily armed and riding armoured troop carriers, had surrounded the place and done all this without provocation. Baz Faisal should, he said. Then it was over.
After the killings, the old man had heard the Russians rushing round the village streets, throwing explosives and fragmentation grenades, shooting and laughing. Women were screaming, some so badly hurt that they pleaded with the Russians to kill them quickly. This, he said, made the soldiers laugh all the louder. They were like madmen. They were madmen. This is not soldiers' work. I know. I have been in the army. I have served my king. He had no more to say and died soon after. Aslam Jan found some spades, but Adam knew that five men could not dig fifty graves in the time he had. They cleared the rubbish from the culvert in which the old man had taken refuge and carried the bodies there. They laid them side by side in a long, grotesque row and covered them with earth scooped out from the sides of the culvert. Now the five men moved to the cover of a clump of bushes half a mile away on an incline from which they could watch the Russian camp. Three days before, Adam and his partisans had descended upon a Russian truck which had broken down and thus been separated from its convoy. There was no resistance from the soldiers guarding it, and the Afghans fell upon the tarpaulins with sharp knives, eager for loot, for guns. They found a load of military bugles. They belonged to a Russian parade formation of musicians who doubled, as in other armies, as pomashes, medical orderlies, in active service conditions. Adam had distributed the instruments along the unarmed men of the caves and told them to get on with bugle practice. Although he had not been able to arm the majority of the men, Adam was still determined to get into the camp and get away with what loot he could obtain. The sixty would be itching to join the fight, but, armed or otherwise, such a large party would be seen quite easily if spotter planes were about. Adam went over the plan once again, making sure that his men understood. Kasim, speaking for the others, said, We joined you in order to learn to obey, Eagle. What we have seen today may help to teach us. But for myself, I seek your permission to use, as my war cry when we attack the Rus, the words, Ura Pabeda, hurrah for victory. You have my permission, the eagle said. And note this, for the purpose of this foray, we have a new name, the name of the dead village. We are now Mujahid Battle Group Kalantut. From where they lay in the bushes, they could see the Afghan flag, the black, red, green tricolor, hanging in the still air over the central administration building, a large square hut in the centre of the compound. Close to the barbed wire perimeter fence, they identified a guardhouse and several low prefabricated huts. The camp itself was built on a hillside, with a brick building, probably an ablutions block to one side. There was a great deal of scrub around, useful cover for an observer, and it was obvious that nobody had bothered to clear the ground for years. Even the eagle, still a novice in guerrilla war, realized that the place was suffering from the slackness which poor organization and fifty years of peace had allowed to creep into the once efficient Afghan army. His information seemed accurate enough, this was undoubtedly the field armory of the Afghan 8th Infantry, now taken over by the Soviets. Too many modern weapons had been finding their way, through desertions and sympathy, into guerrilla hands, and for some time now the Soviet army had been steadily disarming the crumbling Afghan forces. Inside this camp, he felt sure, there would be no more than two or three Afghans acting as liaison officers and interpreters in spite of that Afghan national flag. The armory, if the eagle's intelligence was right, contained mortars, machine guns and rocket launchers in quantities enough to equip a division for war. And that was not to mention rifles and grenades, flamethrowers even. 
Adam and his friends, gazing at this prize, were the only members of his band who had any weapons at all. Five Kalashnikov automatic assault rifles, some pistols and grenades, a flare or two for the signalling pistol, and a stick of dynamite. And in the caves now, three hundred and fifty of the eagle's men and women, aching for action, were waiting for him to bring them arms. Beyond the barbed wire, clear in his binoculars, Adam could see vast riches. As tempting as sweets to a child, they lay there, piled in the open. Half concealed by tarpaulins, the guns and ammunition were neatly stacked, perhaps only recently seized from Afghan troops of doubtful loyalty to the rickety communist regime, and now awaiting either storage or reissue. As night fell, the searchlights on the perimeter's observation towers were switched on, and the thump of generators mingled with the clatter of jackboots as some two hundred men, obviously Russians, emerged from their quarters to line up on parade. So the camp had an independent electricity and water supply. A huge water tank dominated the far side of the compound sitting on top of a watchtower. It was one of six such towers each equipped with a searchlight. In each sat a sentry, and Adam noted that some of them were reading quietly. Like many other Russians, the watchtower sentries wore Afghan army uniforms, a stratagem adopted by the Soviets in the odd belief that this would reassure the Afghan population. No dogs patrolled the wire, which was the usual fifteen feet high, but guards on foot, rifles slung across their backs, moved regularly around inside. There was only a single radio mast with several stubby microwave antennae sprouting at intervals down its length, interspersed with round VHF receiving dishes. It looked almost like some weird metal creation offered as a profound piece of avant-garde art at a fashionable gallery. Five against two hundred, maybe two hundred and fifty. What chance do they really have? As for numbers, grinned the ancient Kizriat, catching Adam's thought and exposing naked gums, I would suggest that fifty to one is just about right for us. Very well, then, the eagle let him joke but did not smile. Now, as you know, if we are not back at the caves or haven't sent a signal, he glanced at his watch, by two hours from now, the support group will set out and the attack will be on. We can only hope that if they come round by way of Kalantut village and see their destruction, their discipline will hold. If it doesn't, the raid will be a disaster from the start. You now have three hours to rest. Be back here then, ready to take up positions and for any last-minute orders. Stay undercover, doubly careful if there is any air activity. Make sure that you do not eat or drink for one hour before the time of action. We don't want people being sick over each other. Besides, vomit is bad for the rifles. Three of the band, young Aslam, the old man Kizrayat, and Tirandaz the sharpshooter, went off somewhere to sleep. The eagle lay back, his head on his knapsack, rifle beside him. Kasim, similarly stretched, lay in the opposite direction so that they could scan the road that ran beside the camp in both directions. Fifteen minutes before zero hour, the five guerrillas reassembled. They settled in the darkness behind the scrub about thirty yards from the armory's outer fence. There seemed to be little activity among the Russians inside, nothing to suggest that they anticipated anything more than another quiet night. Then, a little to his right, the eagle thought he heard something move, perhaps only a rabbit. He froze, and opened his mouth slightly in the way his father's hunter had taught him, a trick that increased the sharpness of one's hearing. At first there was nothing. Then, suddenly, he felt a movement right beside him and knew a real spasm of fear. Out of the darkness, Brilliant white and seemingly as large as a dinner plate, the huge, flat face of an army flashlight glared straight at him, 
held at arm's length by the looming figure of a man. Was it a Russian, creeping out illicitly from the camp, or one of a patrol checking the perimeter wire was intact? The eagle was just registering that he could expect the hammer blow of a bullet at any moment when the Russian, his long-service chevron and star suddenly visible as he jerked his flash lamp in fright, called out like a man who has seen a ghost. In a reflex action, Adam brought up his Kalashnikov, hoping to kill with the first stab of his short bayonet, and, with luck, to do it silently. As he hurled himself at the man, the Russian spun sideways, then head off towards the main gate, shouting wildly to the guardhouse to raise the alarm. Obviously, he had been unarmed. The chevron and star insignia were worn only by men with five to nine years' service. If armed, he would not have run off like that. The klaxons bled over and over again. Then the loudspeakers, Attacker! 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 The eagle could hear men running, oaths carried clearly on the still night air. The searchlights on the towers started to scan the area, seeming to pause at every rock and bush. Adam cursed. Now the element of surprise was lost, and the support group had not yet arrived. He'd only given them two hours to march ten miles over rough country, although lightly laden they would have to jog trot in the dim quarter moon most of the way. Now he would have to call off the operation and give the signal for retreat. This was beginning to look as bad as the fiasco of the bugles. What a commander he was turning out to be. And then, even above the roar from the compound, from all around, like the sound of a mighty army on the march, and punctual to the second, came an incredible cacophony of sixty bugles. The support group, not a single weapon among them, had arrived. A giant field lighter flare exploded, brilliant white, high in the sky, and like some celebration firework, came floating gently down on its parachute, bathing the valley with its weird light. The Russians were trying to see exactly what they were facing. The eagle crept behind a less than adequate rock as machine gun bullets at 600 rounds a minute whipped past him. He could see, and feel from their buzzing whisper, why the people called them messengers of death. The glowing white tracers, fire bullets interspersed with the lead ones, showed the gunners where the shots were going. Both these and the flare gave Adam a new piece of information. If the Russians needed such indicators, they had no infrared equipment to see in the dark. That might help to even out the odds just a little. Adam's patrol group had moved as near as they dared to the camp before opening fire. Then, in a manoeuvre they had rehearsed for days, each man fired a short burst, moved sideways and fired again, ran on and fired once more, giving the impression that the place was surrounded by attackers shooting in relay time. All six of the perimeter searchlights were shut out before the second burst of firing was over. Ten machine guns were already chattering with the sound of the standard Russian light weapon, large magazines with a very rapid rate of fire. The type, an RPK, could cover 800 metres ahead, but needed reloading after only 75 rounds, just over a minute's firing. Not very efficient, compared to many a belt-feed gun. In fact, the armory should have been defended by the heavy Goryanovs, fed by 250-round chain belts. It so happened that these were being checked, and the lighter weapon intended for squad support duty had been substituted. As the flare died, its parachute and burnt-out corpse plopping into a giant oak tree not far from where the eagle was huddled, a body fell heavily beside him in the hollow and young Aslam's voice spoke in his ear, Eagle, I have brought you a prisoner. Above the din of battle, the eagle turned a furious face towards the boy and shouted, Saulan, idiot! We can't take prisoners now! But the Russian, bent almost double behind Aslam, was gabbling, Gospodin, sir! Zalosti! Mercy! He grabbed the eagle's hand and started to kiss it as the sound of battle, trumpets, klaxons grew ever louder. Aslam, get to your post. 
the boy plucked at Adam's sleeve. Eagle, listen, this man says we can get in there through a new sewage pipe. He wants to desert to us. Call off the others and we can try it. Call them off? And risk a trap? Anyway, he only had two signal flares. The Russian was jabbering again. Tovarish, comrade. I am a Sorednik, a comrade in arms. This was like a low-budget film, the eagle thought. A veritable hail of bullets was coming straight at the rock before them, spraying ever more thickly as more and more guns opened up. And one of the enemy wanted to join them? He and Aslam, two-fifths of their fighting force, were crouching here talking to a Russian, while the other three guerrillas were keeping up the attack and might be killed at any moment. On impulse, the eagle reached for his waistband and handed the Russian a Makarov pistol. The man took it eagerly and thanked Adam, bowing several times. Then, beckoning the two partisans to follow him, he moved off, holding the pistol at the ready. The firing had stopped for a moment. The Russians could obviously not see anything moving. Perhaps there was nobody left to move. The Russians signalled to them urgently that they should move forward and to the left. Aslam Jan gripped the eagle's shoulder in caution, nervous that their new ally should be so immediately trusted with a gun. In the dim moonlight, the eagle nudged Aslam and pulled the Russian back, gesturing for his weapon. The man handed back his gun without protest. The eagle smiled, pushed an eight-round magazine into the empty butt, and gave it back to the Russian. Aslam gaped. The eagle was a real leader, a leader you could trust. Who else could have thought on the spur of the moment of such a perfect test? The eagle had arranged that if he fired a blue flare, his group were to withdraw and regroup in a shallow gully some thirty metres to the west. Moments later, as the eerie blue of the flare died away, they assembled. The other three looked despondent, believing that the attack had been aborted. Covered in dust and leaves from crawling through the brushwood, oil from their still-hot weapons streaking their faces and arms, they cursed in whispers. As more flares burst, they saw the Russian and covered him with their guns. To Aslam, the eagle said, Now, where did you find this man and how did you know what he was saying? The eagle tried to see what the Russian looked like and failed. All he could tell was that he was small and wiry and seemed to be continually bobbing about. There just wasn't enough light to inspect his face. He speaks Dari well enough. He just bounded up to me. He had wanted to desert for some time and all this confusion gave him the chance. Lots of others feel the same way, he says. Anyway, he's determined to desert. They still call people Prince, he says, Russian for Prince, as a sign of respect and they're supposed to be the communists. Aslam Jan sounded delighted both with his first prisoner and with his assessment of Russian psychology. The Russian insisted on shaking hands all round, then on embracing his captors, or allies, whatever they were. What's your name? was all the eagle could think of saying at first. Still crouched, the Russian gave him a snappy salute and said, in passable Dari, Zelikov, Roman, humbly reporting, Commandon. He started to say something else. Silence and obey, Zelikov. Thank you, Prince. Chupsho, silence. Da, da, Prince. Surely, thought Adam, the Russian would send patrols soon to investigate the attacker's strength. Out here would become more unhealthy. So why not try to get into the camp through the drain as this impossible Russian was suggesting? Zelikov. Prince, take me through the pipe into the camp. There was no point in risking the others. He told them, back to your original firing stations. Red flare means all is well. Enter the camp. No flare or message in one hour means disperse. Reach home before dawn. In the event of my not returning, the butcher, Hoshnak Kassab, is my successor. Obey him implicitly. I entrust you to God, said Kasim. With faith in God, let's go. 
As they crept forward, they could hear the sounds from the camp louder than ever. Extra searchlights were in action and were panning from side to side, though not to much effect. The engines of armoured personnel carriers were being revved. A distorted voice came so incessantly from the loudspeakers that it could only be a recording of an endless loop tape. Dushman, 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 attacker, attacker, bandit attack. What exactly could the Russian tactics be on a near dark night, milling around inside a lighted camp surrounded by rocks, scrub and grass in which their opponents could hide and through which they could melt away if the Russians emerged? Presumably it was a standard military reaction. There had to be a formal answer to every problem. The Russians believed in the formula response to everything. They would, Adam thought, be better off sitting tight in their cosy defended positions, holding fire until they saw the attacker's next move. Another thought struck him. Perhaps the Russians were scared stiff. The trumpeters, following their orders, had fallen silent. In a way, it was a relief. The noise those sixty men made, none of them ever having blown a trumpet in his life, had a disturbing effect. Though you knew they were on your side, you still felt disorientated. They would start up their hellish clamour again after ten minutes, keep it going for two minutes and then rest, then continue in that way until the order was countermanded. If that kept the Russians bewildered and their guns and attention directed outwards, and if the sewage pipe entrance to the camp was possible, miracles might yet be achieved. Adam and Zelikov crawled on their bellies through the scrub towards the brick wall of the ablutions block. Evidently the pipe discharged from there. Flares of every size, colour and power were shooting up into the sky, some bursting randomly like a fireworks display that had got out of hand, others dropping sedately on parachutes. The Russians were either afraid of the dark, or in a panic. Flares like that, especially the star shells, were almost always used singly, tactically, for giving orders, as the eagle planned to use his. The way the Russians were using theirs was a mixed blessing, as the eagle realised when he saw that Tyrandas had taken advantage of the illumination so prodigally provided by the Red Army to cripple their aerial. The bracket supporting it now hung at a crazy angle, and one of the VHF dishes was hanging by its edge and reflecting the green, red and purple lights in the sky, like the fascia of some one-armed bandit from an amusement arcade. Good. The Russians in there must be without radio now. Only a few yards to go. Zelikov and the guerrilla chief climbed into a concrete pipe, two yards in diameter, jutting out from the brick wall. Inside it was almost dry, but it stank and they retched at first as they made their way some ten yards through the darkness, until the Russian pointed to a metal manhole cover just above them with light showing around its edges, and accessible by a line of hand grips. No guard, inspection place. Here workshop, Gospodin Prince. Just like that, the way in. All that elaborate defence system of barbed wire and machine gun posts, and here was an unguarded door inviting visitors. Unbelievable. But was it unguarded? The eagle decided to gamble. They climbed up the handholds and Adam slowly pushed the manhole cover up. They clambered out and found themselves in a lofty workshop come generator room with humming dynamos all around. The place was brightly lit and smelt of diesel oil, and there wasn't a guard to be seen. Zelikov was tugging at his sleeve. Kill Dinamos, Prince? The eagle took in the crouching figure now, his obsequious manner, frightened face and pug nose, a comic-looking little man with a dirt-streaked face and close-cropped head. If they crippled the dynamos and put the lights out of action, how would they see their way around the camp? No, better to risk the light. No, Zelikov. We'll go to find the Commandant. Where is he? 
Zelikov stabbed the air with his gun. Commandant, very bad. Shoot us. Za, za, za. Adam dug into him with the Kalashnikov's butt. We go find Commandant. Zud Buru. Quick march. The Russian looked at him for a second. Then he shrugged and started to lope along a gallery and down a catwalk which led to the main door of the place. There was nobody immediately outside, and, as luck would have it, the moment they emerged onto the asphalted compound's parade ground, the buglers started again. They sounded nearer than before, and the eagle could now see the scene from the defender's viewpoint. It certainly felt as if the camp was being attacked by hordes of demons. The buglers' musical talents had not developed, and, in their enthusiasm, they were now varying their repertoire by howling like jackals. Zelikov was bounding ahead again like a rabbit. Adam started to cross the compound after him. There were large shadows between the pools of light cast by the arc lamps, and the two men skipped from one to another. Anxious to give themselves enough light to supply the guns, the Russians had left on all the arc lights. Adam and his prisoner, or comrade, were ignored, if they were seen at all, by the armourers, who were hastily carting crates of machine gun magazines in heavy trolleys to the loaders. The latter served the gunners, who, crouching behind their steel shields, were firing as if their lives depended on it. Seeing all of this, the eagle doubted that they had yet hit a single one of his sixty maniacs from the Pagman Caves. An Afghan frontier marksman reckoned that it took between one and two rounds to kill a man. These Russian gunners were firing a total of some 18,000 rounds a minute. The whole place reeked of cordite. A blue haze of gun smoke rose towards the floodlights. Zelikov was pointing to a metal ladder which led from the tarmac to the armoured command post above them. The two of them climbed up and into the heavily protected hut-like room. In it, three men were standing looking with night glasses through slits in the steel plates which served as windows. As Adam and Zelikov entered, the heavy steel doors banged shut behind them. One of the Russians looked around, casually, as if expecting a runner with a message. Then he gave a cry, and the other two officers turned to see what he was staring at. A pair of binoculars fell to the floor with a thud as two of the Russians reached for their sidearms. They were ten feet away from Adam. Using the butt of his assault rifle, the eagle smashed at their right hands, one after another in a single arc, sending the two guns rattling together to the ground. Zelikov picked them up. The third man, evidently the commandant, simply looked as if he had been stunned. He was not wearing a belt and had no gun, and there was no other weapon in sight. Inside the command post there was complete silence. The eagle saw, on the wall beside the Russians, a loudspeaker, a large map of the locality, and a very big poster. It was a hugely enlarged photograph of a fierce-looking bearded and beturbaned tribesman, a dagger gripped in his teeth, with lips drawn back in a snarl. The bright red caption screamed in Russian, Dushman, bandit. Zelikov, without any order from Adam, wrenched down a long loop of electric flex which connected several large desk lamps with their wall sockets, and bound the officer's wrists and ankles after making them sit in a neat row on the floor. He then bowed ceremoniously to the eagle and saluted, All in order, commandeer de prince. On the table was a microphone, linked to a field radio, evidently a short-range one for giving orders to the machine gunners below. Adam saw the commandant's eyes turn towards it, but when the Russian saw that the eagle had noticed, he dropped his gaze and stared directly back at Adam. The eagle assessed the Russian, a tall man, erect, with white hair and very blue eyes in a Slavic face. He had a vaguely unhealthy appearance and was probably not over-intelligent. The Russian said in passable Dari, Who are you? What do you want? We are from the Afghan forces of resistance, battle group Kalantut. We have you surrounded. You are prisoners of war. 
and if you obey, you will be treated in accordance with the Geneva Conventions of War. The man nearly choked. Shoot me, bandit. I don't obey orders from scum. Are you the commandant here? Yes, and you are a filthy swine. Geneva Conventions indeed. We never signed them anyway. Now look, Major. Bolkovnik, Colonel, son of an animal. Colonel, then. I am now the commander here. You are under my orders. I know why you don't sign humanitarian treaties. It is because you want to massacre women and children like those in the village of Kalantut down the road. A vaguely uncomfortable look passed over the Russian's face. The men are lonely here. They don't get much mail, the food and water are bad, there are no women, there is no leave. There is insubordination, I admit it. That sort of thing happens in all armies in times of war. I am punishing the offenders tomorrow. The colonel was suddenly on the defensive. The eagle said, Colonel, you will call up your gunners and give the order to cease fire. You know I cannot do that. I would be arrested and shot. You have already been arrested, and you will certainly be shot if you do not do as I say, but before I shoot you I'll have you taken to pieces, Tika Tika. You know what that means, don't you? First a finger joint, then another, and another, then we move up. The colonel said nothing. The other two Russians had gone white. They knew about the torture. The Soviets had introduced it to Afghanistan. My friend Zelikov here, continued the eagle, will shortly cut off your right index finger. Not too far down, so that we can apply a tourniquet. We don't want you bleeding to death too soon. All expression had drained from the colonel's face. At that moment the radio crackled and a staccato Russian voice spoke from the loudspeaker on the wall. The eagle looked inquiringly at Zelikov. Radio want to know, continue fire or not, officer? Zelikov grinned, evidently pleased with his command of Dari. So, colonel, Adam spoke slowly, deliberately. You will order a total ceasefire, and all soldiers are to withdraw to their quarters without clearing up, leaving their guns and other arms where they are. Do it now. If you do not obey... Zelikov had drawn a long knife and was wetting the edge on the sole of his felt boot. He gestured towards the wall poster, put the knife between his teeth, and glared menacingly at his former commanding officer in a close imitation of the Afghan Dushman. The radio repeated its message, not urgently, just as if it were a routine call. The note of inquiry, however, was quite clear. Nobody moved. Then Zelikov went up to one of the officers. Pulling back his head by the hair, with a gesture of mock artistry, he cut a shallow groove in the form of a crescent across his throat, following the jawline from ear to ear. Blood started to ooze slowly, and the cut looked quite dramatic. The victim closed his eyes as if he were going to faint. Zelikov held the man's tunic open at the neck, displaying his work like a barber proud of a fine shave. The knife in Zelikov's hand was only an inch or two from the officer's jugular vein. In his right hand was the pistol that the eagle had given him, the safety catch visibly off. Give me the microphone, Commander. The colonel was now a beaten man. The eagle handed it to him. The outcome of this whole mad enterprise hung on the next sixty seconds. Remember, Adam said, if you try to trick us, all three of you will certainly be dead before any help can get to you. I'll not trick you. The colonel's voice was barely audible. He took a small microphone on its long lead and pressed the transmitting button. What he said sounded to the eagle like a standard phrase repeated twice. A voice acknowledged the message, and the radio went dead. Zelikov was grinning even more widely. Fire command to gunners. All fire stop. Leave guns. Go to bed, was his version of the message. And guns say, humbly obey, officer. 
Thank you, Zelikov. The eagle took the microphone back. Zelikov saluted. At your orders, Commandir Pience. A moment later, all firing had ceased. Peering through an observation slit, the eagle could see the men below leaving their posts as ordered, slouching towards their barrack huts in a haze of gun smoke. The radio squawked again. My second in command on fire control, said the colonel, speaking very slowly as if the life was going out of him. The eagle looked at him, staring down with contempt. Commander, added the colonel. Tell him to come here at once. Adam handed the microphone once more to the Russian. Two minutes later, hearing sounds on the ladder, Zelikov opened the door, concealing himself behind it as he did so. A very worried-looking major stepped into the cabin and straightaway felt Zelikov's knife in his ribs. He took the situation in quickly enough. After one glance round the room, he unbuckled his gun belt and handed it to the Russian private. Red-faced, short, bald, and middle-aged with huge pointed ears, he looked weary, his face streaked with black machine-gun lubricant, his uniform dusty. Evidently an officer who believed in taking part in the action in spite of his age. Perhaps he had been trying to impress his colonel. Wasn't it strange how unsoldierly a beaten man could look? You speak Dari? he asked the eagle. Yes. As Zelikov was securing his hands and feet, the Major let out a long breath and then started to pant. I was afraid that your forces would mortar us, and those exposed stacks of shells, mines, ammunition right in the centre of the compound. He gave the impression of a man more concerned with practical matters than military etiquette, or even personal indignity. At a glance, he had accepted the Eagle on the same terms. Frankly, I was scared. Scared, Adam said. We were told you were socialist heroes. Don't say it's all propaganda. Maybe you should use smelling salts before you go out and kill any more women and children. Sons of Mother Russia. When you people decay, you'll not even make decent manure. You became heroes in the past by fighting amateurs or frozen armies, that's all. The Major was shaking badly now. He nodded his head slowly and then fast, but said nothing. Zelikov dumped the Major out of the chair he was sitting on with exaggerated glee. You'll not get away, Commander. The Russian colonel looked at the eagle with protruding eyes, realizing, even as he spoke, the implication of what he had said. If the eagle and his men did not escape, he was a dead man himself. That's what the villains always say in Hollywood movies, Colonel, but you ought to know that the hero always gets away. But of course, you are not allowed to see capitalist films. He turned to Zelikov. How far is the gateway, the main gate, guardhouse, from the bottom of the ladder of this place? From the bottom of the steps, maybe twenty metres. Right. I'm going to take a walk now. You, Zelikov, stay here with the prisoners. If I am not back in fifteen minutes, or if anybody fires, you shoot the colonel quick and kill him. You understand? I understand. Understand, and I want to kill. I want to do it. He looked, the eagle thought, like a weasel. You may want to, but only if and when. You have your orders, understand? Understand, Gospodin. The eagle took the Major's pistol and checked it. It was loaded. He slipped the safety catch off and jabbed the muzzle in the man's ribs. What's your name? Major Tarov, Igor. Right, Tarov. I am Karakush, commander of the partisan battle group Kalantut. You will go in front of me and do what I say. If you do not obey, you will be shot dead with no further warning. I'll do it, however, as painfully as I can in the kidneys. I'll do as you say. The man's bald head was beaded with sweat, and the eagle could smell the stench of fear. He was perhaps forty years old, but he was now stooped like a very old man. Adam bent down and untied the major's ankles, and after a moment, thinking of the trip down the ladder, 
his wrists as well. Right, let's go. They moved down the metal ladder, along the now empty compound towards the gate. As they neared it, the single guard, reading the major's rank from his epaulets, snapped to attention. Then he saw the eagle and took in, as if in slow motion, his Afghan shirt and baggy trousers. His gaze moved from the eagle to the major, then to the gun stuck in his back. His eyes stayed fixed on the pistol, as if waiting for the shot. Tell him to open the gate and to keep silent. This was the Major's chance to become a hero of the Soviet Union, but Tarov was already stammering. It took him what seemed like an age to get the words out, but he gave the order. The guard, catching some of the officer's fear, rushed to obey, clutching at the iron bar on his side of the barbed wire as he tried to release the bolt. Eventually, the gate swung open. The eagle took charge of the sentry's weapons and motioned both him and the major into the guardhouse, making them put their hands on their heads. Then he fired his very pistol into the air. Hardly had the red light died in the sky, with the imprint of the curving star shell still on his retina, than the eagle saw his pugman horde, their bugles dangling, come running up. Sixty men in sandals, shirts and baggy trousers, their turbans at rakish angles and not a weapon among them. Not a single casualty on our side, reported their leader, Zafir Khan. They stood around in groups, chuckling and slapping one another on the back. The eagle counted quickly. Thirty machine guns were positioned round the perimeter, intended for firing outwards. They could be swung round for firing into the camp. He ordered Zafir Khan to allocate a gunner and loader to each and to take over the guns without delay. When the RPKs had been turned 180 degrees, they faced inwards and their field of fire covered almost the entire compound of the camp. In ten minutes, called by the loudspeakers, a mass of Russian soldiers poured from their huts and were lined up on the parade ground, hands on heads. Zelikov, seeing the surrender from the vantage of the command post, brought his three captives to join the bewildered Russians below. He had to untie them to get them down the ladder, but felt no danger. The Russians were beaten men even before they saw the scene below. He herded them gleefully into the defeated ranks. Adam was trying to assess the overall position. These Russians, a large proportion of them officers and NCOs, could once they recovered from their shock, be a considerable problem even if they were unarmed. He looked round and saw that the mercurial Zelikov had anticipated that difficulty. He had found a drum of electric cable and was unrolling it across the parade ground. Zafir Khan had understood what Zelikov was doing. He had found a pair of metal clippers and was following behind his newfound collaborator, cutting the flex into four-foot lengths. One by one, the Russians, covered from all angles by their own machine guns, stepped forward to have their wrists tied behind their backs with the flex. The eagle, hitherto a good deal less euphoric than his band of buglers, began to feel that he had, against all the odds, got the situation in hand. The eagle was about to give the order to move the prisoners off when, to his left, his eye caught a movement beside the water tower. Suddenly, a score or more Russian soldiers poured screaming from a barrack hut, some throwing grenades, some firing Kalashnikovs from the hip. Several of the Mujahideen went down, and most of the trumpeter machine gunners had to hold fire for fear of killing their own men. But the two guerrilla gunners nearest to the Russians had a safer angle of fire and opened up, the rattle of their guns mingling with the whoops of the attacking Russians. At that short range, some of the Russians were cut in two by the heavy bullets, but the others came on. Adam found Kasim at his elbow, holding a shallow box of Russian RKG 3M stick grenades, anti-tank weapons, capable of penetrating six and a half inches of armor plating. Far too powerful for hand-to-hand -hand fighting, but there was nothing else to use. The Eagle and Kasim snatched up the little bombs by their stubby wooden handles and hulled them with all their strength, 
straight at the oncoming Russians, now only some twenty yards away. With a dreadful roar and a hellish burst of flame, the two grenades exploded. Their half-kilo high-explosive charges gouged a great double hole from the ground, and the shockwave blew the two guerrillas to the ground. When they raised their heads, most of the attackers had vanished, blown to fragments which now began to spatter from the sky, together with bits of belt buckle, rags from uniforms, and metal from shattered guns. A moment's silence. Then the few remaining attackers came on again, skirting the grenade holes and screaming, Uda Pobeda! In the glare of the floodlights, they seemed to number under a dozen, and the gunners, ripping into them with their lead and tracer bullets, stopped five. The others came on again, apparently out of ammunition but resolved on a bayonet charge. The eagle ran towards the first of them. Attack was his only option if he was to live. Ducking sideways as he reached him, he dealt the Russian the most effective karate blow he knew, low behind the right shoulder and to the left. The man dropped, killed outright. In almost the same movement, Adam turned and snatched up the Russian's gun. Now another man was upon him, bayonet at the ready. But Adam had a longer reach. Kicking the Kalashnikov aside, he slashed with his own, using it like a scythe, aiming straight for the Russian's neck. The man's face, contorted with hate and tension, slackened as he felt the blade cut to the bone and muscle. But he was not finished yet. Blood spurting from his mouth, he lunged again, ripping the eagle's water bottle and ammunition pouch clean in half. But the lunge had thrown him off balance, and he spun, trying to regain his centre of gravity. Adam put the bayonet deep into his side as he fell. The eagle raised his leg, stiff and parallel to the ground, and planted it in the Russian's side, against his hip bone, and tugged. The bayonet came free. He had never imagined he could kill like this. As he looked around, Adam saw that Kasim was fending off the three remaining soldiers. He had somehow disarmed one of them, who was now circling round him, waiting for a chance to pull him down. The other two, evidently out of ammunition, were stabbing and thrusting, trying to get through his guard in a strange parody of ballet and fencing movements. Adam went for the unarmed man. Taking the forepart of his gun in a double-handed grip, he swung the heavy wooden stock hard against the man's face, like a cricketer damping down the ball. The impact jarred his arm right up to the shoulder, and the Russian dropped unconscious. The eagle swiveled his gun and was only just in time to parry a thrust from the second Russian who had leapt in, bayonet in line. Adam saw death a split second away, realised he was off balance and had no response. But Kasim, almost contemptuously throwing off his last adversary, clubbed Adam's attacker from behind with his rifle butt and then turned, swivelling his rifle and driving his bayonet through the leather jacket of the last Russian. The revolt was over. Time was now pressing. The Eagle planned to plunder the supply depot of all the useful arms and supplies which could be packed into the thirteen trucks they had found parked behind the ablutions block. What he couldn't take or didn't want, he would blow up. His own dead and wounded were loaded first and set off on one of the trucks. The prisoners, still hand-tied, went next, packed into three trucks. Feverishly, Adam's sixty-odd men laboured to load the looted Russian supplies into the remaining lorries, Kasim, Zafir Khan and the Eagle making snap decisions as to what was the most valuable and what could be left. When the trucks were loaded, there was room for only a handful of the Mujahid battle group Kalantut. The rest were ordered to disperse and find their way on foot to the caves. Explosive charges with timers were placed inside all the buildings and beside the stockpiles of arms. With a last look round, the eagle gave a mock salute to the field armoury of the Afghan 8th Infantry and piled into the last truck with Kizriat, Tirandaz, Kasim and Zafir Khan. When they were halfway home, the night was suddenly lit with a firestorm. The shockwave from the arms dump exploding was so enormous that it almost sent his lorry lurching off the road. But it was the hopelessness of the prisoners, as much as the huge hall of arms, which excited Adam. Kasim, 
bubbling with good humor in spite of the exertions of the night, kept saying, Guns! Ammunition! Now we'll show them, Karakush! And Adam answered, Kasim, arms are vital, but the Russians, did you see their faces? Did you look into their eyes? We're going to beat them, Kasim. Do you realize that? We're going to beat them. <laughs>